that's that's what's interesting about the the restoration world um, is that like like in a place like the Cuban Club, right in Ybor City, that we have here, it's it's a beautiful building and it it served wonderful purposes throughout the years. Um, they'll go, you know, the, the pe people go through and they need to maintain the building. It, it, it falls in the category of like that, that hotel downtown, La, La Meridienne, you know, that used to be the courthouse. I saw that go through the, the, uh, the process of quote unquote restoration. So you have to understand, you know, what it, what it, what it, what it's like, what, what it means when these big, well, at least down here, these big companies, these, they say they're going to restore something. You've got these architects and engineers that, I'm not sure what, what they're thinking, but one of the things that happens is that these big projects, they go out to bid, right? And they're looking for the lowest price, right, based on a set of parameters uh, put in place by, uh, you know, an architect that might have some knowledge about what they're trying to accomplish and stuff. There's a few out there, um, but what happens is they, um, uh, they put it out for bid, all kinds of contractors get on it, they provide the specs that are necessary, and a lot of times they'll get contractors in that pay lip service to the specs, but their real goal is to get in and get out and, and make their money, right? It's not necessarily a, uh, an enterprise to really save and restore the building. You know what I'm saying? Basically, there's like, there's like legalities put in place that they have to abide by, and so technically, they are abiding by the legal stipulations, but as far so like at the Cuban club, club, what I suspect is happening is something like that. And I've seen it happen. It happened with um, what they call uh, Centro Asturiano, you know, right, you know, real close by, um, where somebody got the contract, low bid, they didn't know what they were doing, and they just basically we're putting a, a, a facade and a band-aid over everything, right? Making it, quote unquote, look the part, right? And it looks the part without really understanding the, the, the context, uh, the background, the history, the, the knowledge that went into building the building like it was. That's like, that's like I was explaining over there, the Centro Espanol building that I was showing you pictures of, you know, Somebody thought it was a great idea to take the windows and switch them from their inst original installation and put them on the outside of the building. Where at the beginning, they, uh, they, they functioned to the inside and they worked perfectly well with the building in balance with nature and the environment so that they were actually energy efficient that way. You could work on them. Then they put them on the outside and they're fused to the outside. What happens? Well, now everything you know starts to to amplify the deterioration process i mean you can't stop the deterioration process completely but you can do things to mitigate it right and nature says build in balance with me i'll let you hang on to it for a while right don't build it in balance with me i take it away it's a simple formula right so you know that, that's that cuban clip club you know i would love to be a part of it but you know i've just i've just kind of come to the realization that you know the kind of people that do those types of projects you know I'm not in align alignment with and I probably won't get up that project I probably won't they probably won't even show it to me you know what I'm saying because you know um, I don't necessarily align with that um, that quick fix facade thing I mean, because people think in facades now right because you know, you got social media, and what's social media? But putting on, put, putting forth your, your best facade. You know, nobody else, nobody puts out their worst face, right? You know, so it's all an act. It's all a show. Everybody's got the, uh, the, the pre, um, 
the, the blue jeans with the pre-torn holes, you know, in all the wrong places. Like, okay, those of us who know how those holes really get there, you know, okay, we know, I mean, we can look at them and say, holes don't get there naturally, right? You know, and what they're, what, what they're trying to replicate, you know, is the authenticity of some, you know, of some greater time, right? But it's not necessarily greater, it's just a, it's a, it's a facade, it's an act. And that's, what, and that's what's so, that, that's what's so remarkable about our, our windows is that some, kind, some part of culture has convinced us that what, you know, that all of the knowledge that we gained, you know, up to the 1920s is somehow worthless and needs to be chunked. It, but, you know, there's so much knowledge encapsulated in these windows that are behind us that uh, to just throw them out, it misses uh, just an enormous amount of knowledge, right? So that's what, you know, that's what these, uh, these windows are about, right? Um, so, um, and that's, that's why we have this class. That's why, you know, I introduced the class this way, you know, is because, uh, um, you know, I want to, I want to give the context, you know, of what we're holding in our hands here, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the windows, there's never in the history, you know, of our civilization has there been. Uh, a, a window is more in alignment with the forces of nature, you know. When you talk about energy efficient, um, I mean, enabling a house to use zero energy is phenomenal, you know, and use forces of energy already at work. People don't think that way anymore, you know. They, they have, a, they have a, uh, an allegiance to, you know, the air conditioner, I guess. I mean, rightfully so, like here in Florida, I mean, you get kind of used to the air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? But you have to think that people evolved outside and they, they know how to live outdoors. And the, the houses evolved as shelters from all of that stuff and they evolved very well. I mean, think about it. I like to talk about, uh, I like to, to think about how, how the windows emerged by thinking about this character I call the hut builder, right? And who is the hut builder? Okay, well, the hut builder is this, is this person that emerged from a cave. He's like, he gets this, he gets this wild hair to go out and, um, and, and get some action, right? But he's got to go outside, and he's away from his cave. He needs some shelter, right? And his shelter he puts up, you know, it maybe keeps some rain off. Maybe it keeps the saber-toothed tiger out for a day or two, but then it falls down. So what does he do? Um... He says, well, I did it this way and it fell down. Let me try it that way. That way might fall down too, right? You eliminate this, you take, that, you, know, you take this little element of that, and then you start to incorporate it into your building science, which is not really advanced, but pretty soon you've got a shelter that'll stay up for a week, okay? And that's pretty good because if it stays up for a week, it allows you to do other things, you know, hang out, um, go hunt, maybe you know, eat some berries. So that, that happens, and maybe the next iteration, it lasts a month, okay? And, it, and, what, and, what, he, and what he's doing, this hut builder, is, is he is competing against nature. You know, nature is gently whispering in his ear, okay, modify your technique a little bit more like this. And so he can take it or leave it, right? If he's smart, he takes that information and he adds it to himself. Okay, so eventually he gets the he gets the the hut that lasts for a month and then a year, and then he's like, "Okay, here's a hut that lasts a while. Let's put a hole in the wall to let some air in." Okay, and so he's a master hut builder that knows how to put a hole in the wall, right? And he decides where to where to put it, and pretty soon. He gets so good at making a hole in the wall, he's got some time, that now he's gonna learn how to frame it out and then close it, okay? Because that's all a window really is, is it's a hole, right? Because everybody needs shelter. I mean, think about this psych psychologically, okay? Everybody needs shelter, everybody needs safety, okay? But we also need to see, 
And we also need to breathe. We also need to see what's on the other side of that wall. You see how that is? So psychologically, you have to have this. And you know, in, in, in humanity, is wired that way. So if you surround a person with four walls, they'll be scratching with their nails to find some light, right? That's just the way that we are. In, so any hole is a window. And you know, a window is where you see what's possible. You see what's coming. You see light. You get inspiration. You know? So you know what's really interesting is, is what's become windows for us? Is our phones. Because what, what do our phones do? Our phones allow us to see alternative realities. They allow us to see a world that's not where we currently are. You see that? You know, our televisions are, are windows of a type. Okay? And so, but, and so, and so, but, you know, but windows emerged, you know, to be able to see, you know, from, from a safe place, something other than where you currently are. And so, that's, that's one of the reasons why, as they emerged through history and people have got better and better at making windows, you know, first the frames come, then the ability to open and close them with some kind of a device. Maybe it was an animal skin, maybe it was a crude shutter, maybe it was a rock that you put in there to keep the animals from coming in and out. But eventually, people discovered things like arches. And, you know, and, and, and well, first I guess it was a lentil. Right? You know what a lentil is? A lentil is you've got two posts and you've got a beam that goes across that can support weight above it. You know, like every door has some sort of a lentil over the top of it. You know, to, so you can, you know, have, you know, so you can build the wall up there. Okay? The, uh, you know, and that, that's, that was a pretty good invention. And then, out, you know, the, the lentil was first, then the arch emerges after that, and man, they got, people got so good at building arches. I mean, look at Rome. I think, I think they, the earliest arches we know of are Mesopotamian, you know, the ancient Near East, you know, Persia and Babylon, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but the Romans are what, who are really known for their arches. I mean, look at the aqueducts, look at the Colosseum, nothing but arches. Okay, and then you get into the middle, the, the middle of the, the middle century, the Dark Ages, and you know when the medieval times when they were building these Gothic churches and stuff like that. Those things are nothing but Gothic arches, right? They're nothing but windows, right? And and they got so good at making windows that I mean they're celebrating. I mean, what do they do? They put they put religious scenery in these things to really accentuate how important they are. You know, you got the light coming in and stuff like that. People got so good at making windows. And, you know, uh, you know, over time, the, you know, they got more and more complex. But then, as, as they got, as, as people got better and better at making windows, they started making them more practically. Eliminating complexities, right? Because common people now needed windows. We're going to build houses and things like that. What are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to make it possible so that most houses can have functioning windows. And so they, was st they were still hard to make. You know, how do they make them? Well, you had to talk to the blacksmith. You had to get some steel. You had to make an axe. You had to make a, a splitting wedge. You had to make a, a chisel. You had to make a plane. You know... Windows were still hard to make, but man, they were still really, really good at it. And you had to fell the tree. You had to split the tree into to, 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 to boards. You had to season it, let it season for years, right? And then you had to split it into smaller pieces and make mortise and tenon joints out of it with crude, well, crude, but to, you know, to our standards, but advanced back then, hand tools fashioning these things together you had to get together with your your local glass blower who was making you glass panes by hand you know putting them into a pane you know so when they're making the windows i mean they're greatly simplified you know for me the enormous church windows these gothic windows but they're still complicated to make 
hard to make, take a lot of human effort. So you know what they're doing? They're making them as good as they can, making them as last, long lasting as possible. They're making them as efficiently as they can, right? You know, and it was still hard, so they're making them to last because they don't want to make them twice. And so what they're doing is they are working out all of the design flaws to get the longest possible lasting window that could have ever been, right? Why make anything else, right? Why make something to fail? People don't think that way. Are you kidding me? It's too hard to make something to fail, right? So this is all wired in us, okay? And so that's what's encapsulated in every single one of these windows, right? Because in every single one of these windows, it's all of the struggle, all of the work, all of the, all of the thinking, all of the blisters, all of the blood that went to make something so simple. You know, we take for granted how simple it is, but without, without really taking into account how many complexities were eliminated to give us this simple design. So neat. That's why I call it the archetypal window. The archetypal is the ideal. I mean, I mean, if you're going to have like the ideal window, this is it. This is the window that is ideal. I mean, this is the window with all the complexities removed out of it. You know, and yet, and it, it's it's the longest lasting window that was ever envisioned, ever designed. The most useful window that was ever designed. And it, so much so that when the second industrial revolution uh, came on and they had all these factories and all these tools and all this stuff, you know, that what window did they build? The same exact window that artisans were building by hand for hundreds and hundreds of years because they'd worked out all the design flaws. Why, why would they have built anything else? It wasn't until they figured out that corporations needed to stay alive that they were building windows and house parts that were going to put them out of business because they couldn't, you know, you know, you know, they couldn't, they, they needed a recurring source of income. And so World War II, you know, and, you know, the housing shortage back then after World War II was over, people coming home, perfect opportunity to introduce some new ideas and designs that would enable the, the corporations to stay alive. And they started experimenting with different planned obsolescence ideas. You know, Anderson in the 1950s, they invented, um, what do you call that, the, um, that double pane glass that everybody, everybody wants right now? That's, that was invented by them in the 50s. And you know what that is? That is the incorporation of a storm window that would be on the outside and the sash with the functional part on the inside, right? So you put the two panes of glass together in a single unit, right? To get, quote unquote, the energy efficiency, you know, so that you could sell more window in a smaller package. I don't know, I'm not sure what the deal is, but it didn't immediately catch on, as you know. You know, these double pane glass only has caught on in the past really 10 or 15 years right where it's really become a thing right and because people knew people were used to the effectiveness of storm windows in conjunction with their actual windows it was all part of the same thing it was all part of the design so so you know so now in you know we hit you know we're in 2021 going to 2022 the uh you know uh the corporations really have a hold of the markets you know, and all that people see, or all the all that people are shown is, you know, a corporate window model where the artisan is, be, you know, they would like us to think that the artisan is is gone, at obsolete. You know, they're not, but they're not doing anything to keep the artisans alive. See that? So, anyway, so that's one of the reasons why we're in business, is because there is a huge demand for what we do, and that's why I think that's why you're here. I think, right? is because you've got a connection and love for your homes and the windows that are in them. I mean, there might not even be words to describe the affection that you have and the connection that you have, but it's there, you know? And you want to connect with it and because there's something there. And 
Um, it's undeniable. And I think a lot of people, people are that way. And most people who get into older homes, they look for people like us. You know, wood window makeover, the wood window museum. And when they don't find people like us, they're, they're somewhat forced into the, you know, the herded, you know, into that corral that's been created for them, you know, to, to, to buy from, you know. That's what, if, if, if you look at the home stores, there's nothing in the home stores to assist you in working on your windows, or really a lot, most of your house. And one of the reasons why is to corral you, herd you, goad you into their products that they want you to buy. You see that? You know? And so they, have, they, they could empower the little people, but they don't. It doesn't work, to, it's not, it doesn't work to their benefit. There's no incentive them, for them to do so. Because they, if they can sell you a product over and over and over again, that's how they win. And then they, that, that turns you into the batteries that keeps them alive. You see that? You, see all the trees, are, see all the trees, you know, that we built America off of are gone. You know, a lot of our natural res resources are being used up, but you know what natural resources we have that's not going to be used up, that has self-interest to keep us alive? is us. We're the natural resource that keeps giving and giving and giving, right? What do we need? We need a little bit of security. We need a little bit of comfort, you know, and all those types of things. And guess what, man? We'll keep paying. Keep paying. We'll go into debt for our cars. You know, we'll get the Home Depot card, go into debt over there for a project. You know, we, we do that. We love that. You know, I got a comment here. Let's see what it says. Huh. I wish someone as good and as passionate as you were around me, we lack a craftsman for windows in our area, and we have a large historic district. Daniel, you're exactly right. And that's, you know, there's, there's, just, there's just not enough of us. And as a matter of fact, in America, there might be 400 people, if you, if you include all the companies that do it, maybe 400, maybe 500 people. And if you do the math, okay, with 325 million people in America, what that means is, with 400 of us, as a percentage, we make up 0.00000138468 of a percent of the population, which uh, my, my son um, did a, uh, he had to do a, a report on the Tasmanian devil, right? And uh, down in Tasmania, and it's an endangered species. And there's like 20,000 of them over there on that island in Tasmania, right? Okay. And there, 20,000 of them, and they're endangered. 400 of us, man, we don't even exist, you know? And so what happens, right, when, you do, when, when we don't even exist, what happens? Then they go find the next best, you know, alternative, which is not really an alternative. So, anyway, um, pretty good story, I think. I wasn't, I've, I've been trying to eat this orange for like, <laughs> but I can't shut up. Um, so what brought you guys here? Um, anybody? I, no, I mean, you've been here before. I could, you know. You need a refresher. You need some inspiration. <laughs> you know, and you get back on the stick, right? All right. So, what's your name? I'm Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know you. Yeah, we're scheduled to do some work together. Awesome. Cool. So you're going to come and learn because, wait, does that mean you're going to do it yourself and take the job I'm away from us? I'm unlikely to do it. Unlikely, myself. yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I've seen your, your calendar of events and saw this workshop or a civil workshop pop up several times and thought that'd be interesting to go to. Um, interesting anecdote. I used to, in college, I worked in a window manufacturing uh, facility in Ohio. Ah. Craftsman windows. Really? Uh, so I worked on the assembly line just building one part of a window for, you know, 40 hours a week or whatever. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And they're called Craftsman Windows. Craftsman. Yeah, it's a brand, it's a brand name. Huh. Yeah, yeah. They were uh, vinyl sash. Uh, wood, wood, wood windows with vinyl sash on the top. Really? And I would build one part. And sometimes you rotate through the assembly line. Um, the worst part was actually the, the finished part of the assembly line when you had to pick up the windows and move them <laughs> Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm fixated on that they were called craftsmen. Craftsmen, yeah, exactly. exactly. 
Why that's would they call it? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Name it right? Yeah. 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 But, see, but see, that's the thing is. And you had a bunch of college kids there doing it. <laughs> what does it mean to be a craftsman or an artisan? You know, as a craftsman or an artisan, what do you what do you do? You know, you go into a place. You know, you can be a brick mason. You know, you can be an artist, and you can be a a clay. What do they call those? A, you could throw clay and stuff like that. A potter. You know. I mean, whatever the artisan is, one of the things that you do is that you solve problems through mastery, right? You've mastered a movement. That's this thing on the board, you know? And then you master a sequence of movements. And then you master sequencing those sequences so that you're so fast and so competent that what you do is mysterious, right? People can't see the little micro movements that you're making in, with your hands, the way that you have the force and the touch and the finesse and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay, that's craftsman, that's artisan, right? Because of the of the the fusion of the mind and the hand and the soul and the heart and the spirit, you know, it's being infused into every single thing they do, right? That idea is really encapsulated in very deeply in the human, right? So that when we think of a word like artisan or craftsperson, we're automatically thinking quality. Why else would you name it that, right? Because, you know, that, that's what, that's, that's what that, that word evokes, right? Is that kind of mentality, okay? So, you know, so you got artisan beer, all right? Okay, I can get it, it might be handmade. You know, you've got, um, not, you know, Sears. Remember, Sears used to have the Craftsman tools Okay, the Craftsman brand. But you know what's happened to that brand? It's crap now. It's been sold. It's at, it's at Lowe's. So many people have bought the patents. I've got, I've got a, uh, a Craftsman hammer. Um, crafts, you can, used to be able to have a Craftsman hammer, right? If you broke the handle, you could take it back to Sears and get a brand new one. I did that, I did that several times, you know? Um, I've got a, I still got a Craftsman hammer. I did a video on it with it where I, I, I pounded 10 nails, one hit, pow, so much fun, and, um, but the handle's cracked, right? I don't think I could take it back to Sears now, you know, yeah, and get it, in front of Sears. you know, <laughs> but, see, but, but see, that's what it was, you know, craftsman tools were known for their quality, right? It's not so much so anymore, it's just a brand, you know, I've got, there's, a, there's this guy I know who calls himself a master craftsman, and I know that it's a ruse, right? not true you know and you know and so and so when they you know so when when everything becomes craftsman when everything becomes artisan guess what it belittles the artisan right it takes away from the artisan right it takes away its eff efficacy so like you can go to Home Depot and look at a window and it's called the craftsman series or the artisan series of windows and it's just this metal piece of crap you know whatever and I see them installed in crappy ways and room additions and stuff like that. So, anyway, that's Kevin. Noah, what, what's, what's your name? Me? Yeah. I'm Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, we have a 1929 house, and um, it had a garage apartment, and I um, took all of the windows down to bare wood, and I redid all of the pulleys, and it was awesome. Oh. So that's the most fun I've ever had. Um, so you could teach our class. It was, I learned the hard way, though, you know, doing it. You're in good company. But we have, in one, in our main house, we have a room that, it was like a porch that they had closed with paneling and crappy windows, and so we are in the process of removing them and we want to build a couple of period windows and put it in That's really nice. We can help with that. I might be calling Ding, 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 that. ding, ding, you know? Because I fall into that. Mm -hmm. Authentic. Authentic. Real. Yeah. And I want to have like hand in putting it in Well, we can do that. You know, we do we do bare sashes for people all the time, right? And they put the glass in and, and they can put them together and stuff like that. So, you know, we've got a whole batch going right now. So, so, and. Um, Carol, I've been with a couple classes. Yeah, Carol, yeah.
Right, well I've got plenty of pro tips. And so look, I'm here for you, okay? And I've always got an agenda, okay? I've always got my class laid out for the whole day, okay? And it always gets blown out of the water by what your needs actually are, okay? Because, you know, what I came to say and what you actually need, they might not be in alignment, you know what I'm saying? So, but I've got knowledge in my head that I've accumulated through the School of Hard Knocks and other ways um, that I want to get to you. So, you know, make sure that you ask me your questions and, you know, and stuff like that as we go so that I can uh, fulfill your greatest wishes for being here, all right? So... I just have one quick question on yeah. education. Uh, so you mentioned the double pane glass, and, yeah. and the Craftsman factory I worked in had a lot of double pane glass, and they'd fill them with Argos or mm -hmm. a different type of gas in between those panes. Yeah. Um, I mean, was that ever, was that just a marketing stunt, or there was some benefit we can? Well, I mean, I'm sure there is some benefit to that, you know, because... They can lie. They can lie about a lot of things, but they mean. I mean, there's got to be some grain of truth in there. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, they couldn't say it, yeah. right? But what's probably not being said is the benefit to them by giving that to you, right? Because it's supposed to get you energy savings. Is that correct? Right. Right. Okay. All right. So it's supposed to get you energy savings by spending twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Okay, and going into debt, right? Okay, just just so we have that straight. Okay, and, yeah. And I, I read that you know, the, having a storm window on an old window is a very good person. I knew. Well, you, you know, having a storm window on an old window. See, I would call it an archetypal window. Right? Really, I would call it an archetypal window. Having a storm window on an old window like that is as efficient. And you know how I know? Because that's where they got the idea to put double pane glass to begin with. Even though there's no argon gas involved. <laughs> well, but the, you know, but it's, see the thing, it, it's, it's the gap. It's the air gap. You know, the air provides an, in, you know, an insulation there. Plus it protects the window. Plus it protects the window. And yeah, it, 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 um, it takes the brunt of the, the weather. First, just like here in Florida, if you have screens, the screens will always take the brunt of the weather before the window will. You know, it acts as a shield, right? So, talk about energy efficiency. Wow, you know. So, but, you know, but to answer your question about the argon, I mean, I'm sure it does something, but there's a cost associated with that, you know. Um, so you have, so you have to spend twenty thousand dollars to save three hundred dollars a year on your electric bill. Sounds reasonable. And then sometimes the double panes, they, the steel breaks after 10 years. They fail. And the so, you, I mean, see, but see that, and that's the thing is, you know, but people want to be lied to, right? They want to be sold that kind of stuff, I guess. You know what I'm saying? They want to, you know, and, and if they can get somebody to, to lie to them and make them feel good, then they'll buy every time, you know? You know, it's a because it's a you know it's a shallow world we live in. You know what I'm saying? Shallow. All right. Let me go ahead and I'm going to shut this. Uh, I guess I'm going to shut this live video down because I'm going to. Um, I guess I got to start teaching. I guess instead of pontificating and um, I guess I kind of am teaching, right? Hopefully I'm inspiring. You know? um, so I got this window behind me. You can see the red window weight. Um, I'll show you how it comes apart, goes back together. A lot of this already I might be preaching to the choir, especially those who have already um, done a little bit of their own work. Okay, But I will say some things I'm sure that will help speed you along your way. All right. So, all right. Thanks for watching, Internet friends. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And leave a comment, share this, you know, all this kind of stuff. And... Um, let us know what you think. Love you. Bye.